the ideal way to cache your front end website. Now this topic, this is a very interesting topic if you want to become a better software engineer. So generally on a day to day basis, you just write features, deploy code to production, see those features come into life and that's it. But if you want to dive deeper into how deployments work behind the scenes or how your website is served from the backend or the server, what pages appear in your network section and in what order, how the CSS files are fetched, how the index files are fetched and all that. So if you want to be a better software engineer or a better front end engineer or a better web engineer, then you need to know topics like these. So the ideal way to cache your front end website. Now this is a very essential topic. So generally when you deploy your front end, what you usually do is you let's say either use Vercel or have some VPS you host it over there. So for, an, for example, let's say you have AWS then in, then in AWS, you basically put your entire code, your GitHub code that you have, you basically create an EC2 instance. You give to this EC2 instance, some operating system, let's say Linux, Linux operating system. Then to this, you set some, allocate some memory. And then at the end, you end up having some sort of a server where your front end code is present at. And then in that EC2 instance, you have your front end repository. So there you run the npm run build command. And then once the npm run build command runs, that is what's shipped to the user. And when the user enters the name of your website, like www.whatever.com, in that case, your EC2 instance serves the output that you get after doing npm run build to your users. And then the users are able to see your web page. So basically when you do npm run build in your EC2 instance, so this is your EC2 instance, let's say. So here there's a build folder that you get once you run npm run build. This, this build folder is finally served to your website. So basically this build folder is what people see when they go to your website. So every time, let's say you have GitHub action set up. So every time you push code to your main branch or your dev branch, it automatically runs npm run build. It pushes the code to your branch. Then there's a workflow file where it runs npm run build. Then the build folder gets created and then that is what's served. And then behind the scenes, there's, there's a lot of things going on, such as a reverse proxy, which allocates your port number to your website domain. Then there's AWS route 53, where your domain name points to a name server and all those things, but you don't need to know about that. But basically I want to talk about the ideal way to cache your front end website. Now this method, which I talked about the EC2 approach where your code is in the EC2 instance and every push triggers an NPM run build. And then you have to make sure that your EC2 instance runs every time and every time your code has changes and it's pushed to the main branch, then automatically a new build folder is created and it's served to your website. So is this the right approach? Is this the best approach to be honest? Because in this case, your EC2 instance is always running and it can incur costs. So a lot of people go with this approach because this is how you start to learn how to deploy your application on your own. Basically in the cloud, using the AWS cloud, when people want to learn how to deploy their application for the first time, this is how they learn. They create an EC2 instance and they make certain changes to it, set up a reverse proxy, point their domain name to their respective name server, and then they host their website. But this can cost a lot because EC2 instances have specific fixed costs, which can be more considering the number of users that come to your website. Let's say your website has less number of users coming to your website. You will still be paying a fixed cost to your EC2 instance. And there's, and there's also the fact that your because it's hosted, because your code is in an EC2 instance, it's not being served directly from a CDN. And because of that, your website doesn't get cached. And due to that, every time someone enters your website, they have to get your website from the server itself to be able to view your website. And this can take a lot of time. Let's say your website is hosted in India. Let's say this is your website hosted in India. This is the server. And someone from US wants to access your website. So in that case, your EC2 instance is in India, but from someone from US tries to access your website, it's going to take some time to ensure that they are able to see your website because the region is completely different. So it's going to take some time for the information to travel. But let's say if you add your website in a CDN, then the purpose of a CDN is to cache your data, right? To cache your website. So if your data, if your website was in a CDN for every different location, let's say US or there is Europe, you would have a CDN for your website 
in different locations. So, so when someone from US tries to access your website, the CDN from the CDN nearest to US is going to be fetched to the user trying to access your website from US. And same goes for Europe. So this entails that we need to host our front end. Basically, we need to keep our front end in a CDN so that users can see your websites quickly. So every time CDN comes into the picture, caching becomes a thing. So CDN and caching, they are related because CDNs cache things. Okay. So now let's dive into this workflow, which is not the EC2 instance way. This is a different way where you can serve your front end website, avoiding the EC2 route. So let's read about this. So you're a developer, you write your code locally, you push your code to the GitHub main branch, let's say some other branch. But let's just consider the main branch because you have your code pushed to the dev branch then it gets merged to the main branch. So finally your code is getting pushed to the main branch. Then when it gets pushed to the main branch, you have GitHub actions. Basically you have a YAML file which has certain instructions that say what to do when code is pushed to a particular branch. In this case, the main branch. So when your code is pushed to the main branch, your GitHub actions get triggered. Basically those set of instructions start uh, start running one by one. So once the GitHub Actions are, is triggered, it checks out your code, it installs the dependencies, and it runs the npm run build command. So basically, when you get a React code base, let's say, what happens? You know that for the user to finally be able to see your website, you need to run npm run build because the final build file is going to contain the minified version of your code. It's going to be bundled properly, and this Whenever someone tries to check out your website, the server sends the build file from your front end to the user. And this includes the CSS, JS, everything, which allows the user to view your website. So to build a file, we obviously need to first install the dependencies. So when you first clone a project from GitHub, what do you do? You, you run npm install, right? npm i. That installs all the dependencies. Once that's done, then you can run npm run build. That's pretty self-explanatory. Anyone who's worked on a React project, they know this. So you run npm run build. Then what happens is you get, after this, you get the slash build folder. You get the build directory. Now, instead of having all this stored in an EC2 instance, what you can do is you can write a script in your GitHub Actions itself, which once the slash build folder is generated, what it does is it can directly upload this build folder to the S3 bucket. All right, so over here you can see upload build folder to S3 bucket using AWS CLI. There's literal examples for this everywhere on the internet. Using the AWS CLI, it gives you some keys and all. So once your slash build is generated, what you can do is using some AWS commands in your GitHub Actions itself, you can upload this slash build folder to your AWS S3 bucket. Now, what's the use of this? We'll see, don't worry. So after this, what happens is AWS, in AWS, your S3 stores the static files, which is nothing but the slash build, where your entire website code is present. Then over here, it's written CloudFront checks for changes in S3. So what is CloudFront? CloudFront is exactly the CDN. So when you have something stored in your S3, S3 is nothing but a bucket. Just know that it's a file, just consider it as a file storage where all your files can be stored, let's say images, videos and everything. But in this case, we are storing our build folder in S3. So in AWS, you can add CloudFront in front of S3 to ensure that anytime we want to access that folder or any information from S3, any file from S3, we can get it from CloudFront directly rather than having to go to S3 all the way. So for example, let's say this is CloudFront. This is nothing but a CDN. And this is S3. So, and this is where you are, the user. So CloudFront is always nearer to the user because this is the CDN. And the CloudFront contains data from S3. It can contain the data from S3. So this means your CloudFront is nothing but the cache. Okay, let me just zoom out. All right, that just went away. So basically, CloudFront, S3, user. All right, and then from here, this is the CDN. It is caching information. Okay, so so the, when the user hits your website in the domain, it searches for your website. It will go to S3. It will check in CloudFront first, 
whether your whether the slash build exists if it doesn't it goes to s3 cloudfront goes to s3 because you put cloudfront in front of s3 which you can do from the aws console itself in the aws console you can add cloudfront in front of s3 which is going to ensure that all your s3 files gets get cached to cloudfront if it was accessed once before so cloudfront is going to look in s3 if if it finds the slash build then the slash build is going to get stored in the cloudfront and then it's going to be given to the user. So the next time the same user tries to access your website, it's going to go to CloudFront again. It's going to see that the slash build already exists and it's going to send it back from here rather than having to go to S3 all the way. Okay, so that is what the CloudFront cache does. So your S3 stores your slash build, then the CloudFront checks for changes in S3. So this means you need to have CloudFront set up in front of S3. So every time you do npm run build so every time you push your code to the main then npm i is run npm run build is run and a new build folder is stored in s3 so when a new build folder is set in s3 then what happens is in aws the cloud front is going to check for changes in s3 so if there was a new build folder in s3 then it's going to invalidate the cloud front cache which means the old build folder is going to be removed and the new build folder is going to be added to the cloud front because the S3 now has the new build folder. So we need to also ensure that every time we push the code to the main, then in S3, the old build folder should be overwritten with the new build folder. And we need to also ensure that the cloud front cache is invalidated so that when the user enters our website, the cloud front doesn't serve with the old build folder. It serves them the new build folder. All right, so cloud front checks for changes in S3. If there is a new build folder, it gets that new build folder. If there's a new build folder, it invalidates the CloudFront cache so that the old build folder gets removed and then CloudFront caches latest assets at global edge locations. So you can modify this completely based on your requirement. You can add US, Europe, whatever, based on where your traffic majorly comes from. So this will ensure that CloudFront now contains your latest build folder. Then what happens is when the user opens website URL, basically whatever the name of your website is, your DNS points to CloudFront. Just know that when you create an S3 bucket, you get a URL for that bucket, right? Because you need to store information files in that bucket. So you get a URL for that bucket. And similarly, when you add, when you add CloudFront, which is a CDN in front of S3, you get a URL for that CloudFront CDN as well. So that means our website URL, whatever it's going to be, like www whatever.com example.com whatever the dns of that url our website's url is going to point to the cloudfront url behind the scenes so you can do you can do that by using aws route 53 route 53 where you can point your domain to the cdn url which will ensure that every time someone types the name of your domain behind the scenes it hits that cdn and fetches the information from that cdn to your domain the user will see this domain name but behind the scenes it will be hitting that cdn so you're you can do that by pointing your dns to the cloud front so cloud front cache serves the cached content it checks if it already has the slash latest slash build folder if it doesn't have the build folder at all it goes through s3 gets the build folder if it does have the build folder it just returns that build folder directly from its cdn right away so you can see over here if not cached fetches from s3 and then caches it so in this approach you do not have to Add your front end code to an EC2 instance. You can make sure that only your back end code is there in the EC2. Basically, your back end repo or your back end directory is there in the EC2 instance. So, your EC2 instance runs only for the back end repository, ensuring that you can allocate less memory to your EC2 instance because it's only going to handle one code project, not both front end and back end. And you can put your front end build folder directly in the S3 plus CloudFront setup. This is going to ensure that your front end doesn't have to rely on the EC2. All right. And this is also going to ensure that your front end is served very fast to users coming from different locations and also your current existing location where the website is hosted. So overall, it's going to be a win win for you because you're going to have reduced EC2 costs because you can allocate less memory to this or even remove EC2 completely if you were using EC2 only for front end as well as it's also going to ensure that you're going to have better speed because your website is going to be served from a CDN, from a cache. So people are going to quickly be able to view your website. So it's basically a win-win situation for you. So what I think is this is the ideal way 
to cache and serve your front-end website to your users to ensure better speed, better performance, and the overall better experience. So for me, this is the ideal way to cache your front-end website. If you have any other approach that works out better for you, then I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. So with that, if you found this video insightful, drop a like and subscribe for more.